Tonight, near an icy sea, on a rugged coast, a legendary people prospered, and then they vanished. Witness the rise and fall of the lost Vikings and uncover the secrets of the dead. of the Dead was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Greenland, the world's largest island blanketed by ice two miles thick, where glaciers meet the sea and icebergs choke the fjords. For more than a thousand years, settlers have called this marginal land home. Amidst the scattered dwellings of today's residents lies a mystery from the past. are all that remain of a lost Viking civilization. About a thousand years ago, the Vikings, Norsemen from Norway, established a colony in Greenland. For almost five centuries, they flourished here. Then they suddenly disappeared. They left behind a riddle that scientists Historians and archaeologists have all failed to solve, until now. The colony in Greenland disappears from history in about the year 1500. Nobody knows exactly why or exactly when this happened. It's one of the great unsolved mysteries of the Middle Ages. settlement to disappear lay on the west coast of Greenland. Around 1340, a visitor from the Vikings' home in Norway sailed into this fjord. What he found shocked and amazed him. The emissary's name was Ivor Barterson. When he arrived there, the place was empty. There was no one there. And he says in his report, I saw nobody, neither Christians nor heathens, only some wild cattle and sheep all running wild. This means that the settlement was empty. The Norse Greenlanders had left or died out, probably fairly recently since the domestic animals were still there. Barterson was the first of many who over the centuries have wondered what could have caused a once prosperous civilization to suddenly disappear. Today, 650 years later, an international team of scientists has come to Greenland hoping to find the answer. The team includes archaeologists, physicists, chemists, and botanists, who are pooling ideas and resources. Among them is Dr. Bent Frenskild, a botanist who has been fascinated by the lost Vikings for more than 40 years. It's a long story. <laughs> it started 55 was my first visit and since then I have spent 29 whole summers in different places in Greenland. Outside the few small towns, Greenland has no roads. Like the Vikings before them, the scientists rely on boats to get around. One of the first steps in their investigation is the excavation of a key Viking site. 
In a remote coastal valley, a sheep farmer has stumbled across the ruins of a farmstead. The team of scientists from Scandinavia, Britain, and the United States is led by Dr. Jette Arnborg of the National Museum of Denmark. The disappearance of the North Green River is a mystery. Every new generation has new answers, and I think that's very exciting, and in a way that reflects that history is very much alive in our society today. The team will camp here for a month, <laughs> making the most of the few short weeks of the Arctic summer. They hope this dig will yield the answer to what really became of the Greenland Vikings. They turn to what may seem like a peculiar place to look for clues. Here they are working through a midden or garbage dump. Every farmstead had one, and into it generations of Viking families threw their waste. Everything from leftover food to the outgrown treasures of childhood. horses were for, but we guess that they were toys, children's toys. So perhaps they had something, uh, something to do with horses here, yeah, I don't know. Every object will be dated, because the archaeologists can calculate exactly when each layer of the midden was laid down. The, the very top of the, of the transect is a layer that ca just came on, on a few years ago. And then beneath this, we have a recent peat layer. And then there's the first uh, Norse layer, one could call it, which has a lot of charcoal and bone remains in it. The, the Viking period is actually documented from all the way from the bottom until uh, 15 centimeters below the recent surface. The excavations have helped the team build up a remarkably detailed picture of life in Greenland at the height of the Viking civilization. They have gleaned further facts from an extraordinary collection of historical documents written by Icelandic scribes in the Middle Ages. These chronicle how the Norsemen first came to this unknown land, then on the outermost edge of the known world. Now preserved in this institute in Iceland, the sagas present a wider picture. They illustrate how the Vikings built an empire that extended from their homeland in Scandinavia, east across Russia, and south to the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. The Icelanders in the Middle Ages were notorious for uh, writing. They wrote much more than any of their um, Scandinavian neighbors. They were writing sagas about uh, kings, legendary heroes of the Viking past, and themselves, as well as people in the Faroe Islands, the Orkneys, and in Greenland. And uh, this is where we are told about the uh, Greenland voyages, about the discovery of uh, North America. America, called Vinland by the Vikings, was the westernmost outpost of their empire. In the 1960s, archaeologists discovered and reconstructed the only known Viking settlement on the North American continent. It's at La Anse au Medo, on the northern tip of Newfoundland. Here, the Vikings built houses for around 100 people. But the sagas suggest the experiment was short-lived. After perhaps as little as three years, constant skirmishes with the indigenous people and the difficulties obtaining supplies from Europe drove the settlers away. Of all the Viking colonies, the American was one of only two that failed. The other was in Greenland. The sagas record the facts of the Greenland colony's foundation, but mysteriously do not explain the settlers' disappearance. 
The earliest and most reliable source tells us uh, of a man called Eric the Red from Norway who had heard of a country to the west and sailed to find it and discovered it and called it Greenland and then went back with 25 ships of settlers. Eric the Red settled uh, in what's called the Eastern Settlement in Greenland, once there was also a smaller settlement in the Western Settlement. Of the 25 ships that went to Greenland, only 14 arrived, but later colonists kept arriving after that. The scientists have established that the Viking colonists were farmers. They lived in houses like this Icelandic reconstruction, built from turf, stone, and timber in the style of their ancestors back in Scandinavia. The life of the Greenland Vikings was being pieced together. They lived in small, isolated farmhouses, and you have to remember that it was dark for most of the year that far north, so they would sit indoors and amuse themselves by composing poetry, telling stories, carving toys out of wood and ivory, playing chess, perhaps. The Vikings built houses, stables, and cowsheds, hidden in sheltered valleys among the coastal hills. they grew fodder and hay for their animals on the high pastures. One task for today's archaeologists is to map these settlements. Here are the remains of a compound one farmer constructed for the sheep, cattle, and goats he'd imported from back home in Scandinavia. The ruins show that over the years the Viking population grew. Before their disappearance, up to 6,000 people occupied Greenland. In winter, the Vikings lived cheek by jowl with their animals, sheltered from the piercing Arctic cold. Unable to exercise in these cramped conditions, the animals lost the use of their legs. And when spring finally came, they had to be carried out into the fields to graze. The Vikings lived by subsistence agriculture in Greenland, and they had to import a lot of the things uh, that was necessary to their lifestyle. So they had to import timber for their housing, they had to import uh, iron for the, the nails to build their houses with. Um, and in order to get these from abroad, for instance, from Norway, they exported uh, Greenland falcons, uh, which were known as far away as Sicily. exported walrus ivory and in the early Middle Ages uh, this was the only source of ivory. It was uh, exported throughout Europe and carved into beautiful objects found in churches, crucifixes, caskets and the like. For 500 years the settlers flourished. With the money from trading they built magnificent churches. This one at Volse is the only one still partly standing today. As their prosperity grew, they even sent a message to the Pope in faraway Rome telling him they needed a bishop. In exchange, they offered the gift of a polar bear. But this success did not last. In the 14th and 15th centuries, something unexpected made the Greenland Vikings disappear from their settlements. The last known communication from Norse Greenland was in the year 1410 when a party of Icelanders arrived in Norway, having come from Greenland. While they were there, two of them uh, decided to get married, and we have very detailed records of the wedding that took place in the church at Valse on the 16th of September in 1408. And it said that there were many people there, both Greenlanders uh, of Viking descent and foreigners. In nomine Patris, Ophelia, Spirit, Sante. It was also Patris, done properly. The bands were read out in church for three weeks running Patris, before the wedding. 
The same Icelanders also witnessed some dramatic events while, while they were in Greenland. Um, a man called Kolgrimur, uh, who had apparently seduced a married woman using witchcraft and black arts, was sentenced to death by burning at the stake. The woman he seduced never really recovered from this experience and she died shortly afterwards. After this report, nothing more was heard from the Greenland Vikings. They vanished seemingly into thin air. Okay. Today, the finds from excavations are all that archaeologists have as they seek an explanation for the mysterious disappearance. But this hasn't stopped them from toying with some extraordinary theories. One possibility is, is the plague, that they died of illness and the colony was just wiped out. Another possibility is that they were kidnapped by pirates. It's also been suggested that they've um, uh, intermarried with the Inuits, the native Greenlanders. Other investigators claim the Vikings perished in a war with the Inuit. Sagas, ancient records of Arctic history, tell of battles lost by the settlers. In one, 18 Vikings lost their lives. Pioneering excavations at the beginning of the 20th century provided further valuable leads. From graves in Greenland's Viking churchyards, archaeologists recovered human bones and farmhouse middens yielded thousands of artifacts. They even found medieval clothing, perfectly preserved in the permafrost, with their colors still fast. Now, almost a century later, the bones are finally revealing clues that may explain why the Vikings disappeared. The University of Copenhagen is the new resting place for these samples. It is also where Dr. Niels Linnerup has been pursuing the mystery. A pathologist well-versed in the latest forensic methodology he has been using modern techniques to analyze the ancient bones. And he has come away with a significant discovery. His research shows that the Vikings' life expectancy fell during the last years of the settlements. The cause? A dramatic decline in people's living conditions and a corresponding deterioration in health. We have the remains of about 350 Norse. The average lifespan was about 30 to 35 years. But we think maybe there was a decline throughout the settlement period. People would be living maybe to 35 years old, and then gradually the lifespan fell by a couple of years throughout the 500 years of settlement. Dr. Linnerup turned back to the bones for an explanation. Skull x-rays revealed that in the later years, many of the Vikings suffered from middle ear disease a sign of deteriorating health that indicated susceptibility to more serious diseases. We found that there was a higher frequency of middle ear disease in the later settlement period as compared to the early settlement period. Again, indicating that living conditions were getting worse, more and more people were getting more common diseases as pneumonia, and then again, that would mean that more were also dying from that disease. of the bones revealed another important clue. We also found that there was an over-representation 
of young adult female skeletons in the graveyards, which could also indicate worsened living conditions. Because we know that uh, young females, along with infants and the very old, are those most susceptible to diseases. Linerup's discoveries pointed to a crisis. The people most vital to the future of the settlement, young women of childbearing age, were dying off. And in the silted up ruins of a farmhouse, the archaeologists found a chilling pointer to the fate of the other settlers. Lying in the kitchen were the bones of a newborn calf and a Norwegian elk hound or Viking hunting dog. The bones were covered in knife marks. Both creatures had been butchered and eaten. The investigators knew that no Viking family would have slaughtered their hunting dog unless faced with certain starvation. A study of fossilized flies provides confirmation that a famine raged in Greenland in the last years of the Viking colony. At Sheffield University, Peter Skidmore has pieced together the story using flies recovered from rooms at the farmhouse where the dog's bones were found. Fossilized flies can tell us a very great deal. Some of the material from Greenland that I've examined has been amazing condition. I have here a batch of specimens that uh, Max has extracted from one particular room in a, in a Norse dwelling. That species, Telemarina flavipes, only bred in situations that were warm. It's what they call the thermophilus fly, and it breeds in decaying animal matter. The sort of situation that this fly would require would be found in a dark, warm room in those days, with plenty of droppings. Precisely a description of the Norse living room in those days. As he'd expected, Skidmore found warmth-loving flies on the floors of the bedroom and the living room at the farmhouse. While in the food larder, another type had flourished. This fly loved colder conditions and lived off meat. But on the top layer of silt, formed at the end of the Viking's occupation, he found something quite different. The warmth-loving flies had disappeared, and the cold-loving flesh-eaters had moved into the bedroom. Skidmore knew what that meant. They'd gone there to feed on the dead bodies of the settlers. Purely looking at the flies, there was a build-up of carrion in the bedroom, and it looked all pretty sinister, really that possibly the occupants had died in the beds. In the hope of discovering the cause of this tragedy, the scientists looked to Greenland's forbidding interior, almost entirely covered by its ice sheet, two miles deep and more than a quarter of a million years old. Here, an extraordinary scientific feat might provide critical evidence that could lead to solving the mystery of the Viking's disappearance. Ice Sheet Project, or GISP-2, was a difficult drilling operation in the barren interior. A single core of ice was carefully extracted from the ice sheet. Some sections were brought to the University of New Hampshire for storage and study. Thickness of the ice in the area that we conducted our study is about 3,000 meters. In fact, it's exactly 3,056.4 meters because we drilled right down to the bedrock. As snow falls on Greenland, it absorbs chemicals, gases, and dust from the atmosphere. Over time, this snow compacts into ice. Scientists looking at a section of ice core from the past 250,000 years can get a good idea of what was happening to the climate at any given time. The ice core is a 5.2 inch diameter core. And what's particularly remarkable is that within any layer, we can recover 50 different measures or, or descriptions of what the environment is like. So here we have the best preserved record, a frozen atmosphere for that one particular year. 
The ice cores reveal that when the Vikings first settled in Greenland, around the year 1000, the climate was exceptionally fine, but it wasn't to last. There's evidence when the Viking colony was first established that the weather was actually rather good. Um, there's even a 13th century Norwegian text which says that the weather in Greenland in the summer at any rate is nicer than in either Iceland or Norway. Um, but what seems to have happened is that uh, the weather got gradually colder. To measure how cold it became, Dr. Lisa Barlow of the University of Colorado analyzed the atoms inside the ice cores. She was looking for deuterium. Most water molecules are made out of two hydrogens and one oxygen atom. A very small percentage of water molecules are made out of one hydrogen and one heavy hydrogen, which is called deuterium, and an oxygen molecule. Now, these water molecules with the deuterium are uh, slightly heavier, and so they respond differently to processes like evaporation and precipitation. In cold weather, the heavy deuterium does not evaporate as easily, so less falls back to the earth in snow. So as you look through the snow, if you had a profile from the surface of the snow and looking down through, so we're looking down through time, you have this nice seasonal signal where um, in the summertime there's a little bit more of the deuterium in the wintertime is a little less. Dr. Barlow found that the ice cores from the end of Viking times contain abnormally little deuterium. Her conclusion? The climate grew colder. In fact, Greenland was hit by a small ice age. When the Norse traveled to Greenland during a very mild period in Earth history, the medieval warm period, the conditions were relatively mild. Having lived there for many generations, they would have been extremely surprised to suddenly find out in the late 1300s and early 1400s that things were changing around them. But the evidence of the series of cold summers came only from the ice in the center of Greenland. sure that the climate had also changed at the settlements on the coast, Dr. Henry Frick of the University of Michigan compared the ice core results with data from the bodies of the Vikings themselves. He knew that teeth, too, could provide an accurate record of weather during a person's lifetime. In my research, I'm taking this one step further, and I'm using the oxygen isotope ratio of, of uh, tooth enamel to act as sort of uh, a record or a proxy for that of local rain or snow. And we can do that because um, in the case of the Norse, they were probably getting their drinking water from um, little ponds, streams, melt water from snow. So that water from the surface gets incorporated into their bodies, into their blood, and then uh, eventually into the teeth so that the oxygen isotope ratio of that tooth enamel can act as a record for what the temperature was at the time that that person was living. This tooth comes from a Viking graveyard in Greenland. Dr. Frick only needs a few grains of its enamel for his tests. The 650-year-old tooth enamel is mixed with chemicals and heated to 1,400 degrees centigrade. The resulting gas is then put through a mass spectrometer that measures the oxygen isotope ratio. Frick runs tests on a series of teeth from carbon dated skeletons of different ages. His results confirm a drop in surface temperature at around the middle of the 14th century. He notes that this date coincides with the very time that the emissary, Ivor Barterson, had found the deserted western settlement. This isotopic evidence confirms the results that the people working on ice cores are getting. The cooling that they observe in those ice cores was in fact lived through by the people right there on the coast of Greenland. A mini ice age could have delivered the death blow to the Viking's farming system. 
Lisa Barlow believes it caused their hay crops to fail, leaving the cattle and sheep without food for the bitter winter months ahead. If you have lower summer temperatures, then that affects the amount of grass that can be grown. Now, the important thing about that is not necessarily that summer, but the fact that these people are trying to feed their cattle for the next nine months of winter on whatever they can grow in the summertime. Proof that the harvest failed came from an unlikely source, fossils of the beetles that lived in the fields and haylofts of Viking Greenland. When the scientists counted these fossilized insects, they found that their numbers fell dramatically in the last years of the settlement, an irrefutable sign that hay production slumped to crisis levels. In some of the later samples, there's a suggestion in changes in the fauna that the hay field is being denuded that either they are so short of hay, they are over-exploiting it, or they are overgrazing it. And the reason they're taking too much hay is that they haven't enough to keep their animals uh, alive through the winter. Eventually, you reach a critical point where you can't maintain your breeding population of animals. And if your stock dies, then you die. So there was more to the Viking's disappearance than the climate change alone. Dr. Bent Frenskild is a Danish botanist who worked on the mystery for more than 40 years. He believes that the Vikings were finding it difficult to feed their livestock long before temperatures plunged Greenland into a mini ice age. On his research trips to Greenland, Dr. Frenskild took hundreds of mud cores from lake beds. He found that the samples contained soil blown off the meadows in Viking times, indicating that the settlers had overgrazed the land, causing widespread erosion. Yeah, the, the large erosion area we are going to see is just behind this ridge and in front of the two dark bed rocks. In modern times, overgrazing has again depleted the thin soil. And Fredskill believes the situation was the same in the Middle Ages. Then, as now, the sheep and cattle ate away the ground cover, once blooming with plants like the Greenland willow. Here's a large root of a northern willow, the same species as grown there. And it has been exposed as a result of uh, severe erosion. This erosion started because of uh, overgrazing. The sheep uh, broke the thin vegetation cover. With the vegetation cover broken, the harsh wind coming off the inland ice tears into the soil and blows it away. Dr. Fredskill believes that by overgrazing, the Vikings turned their once fertile pasture into wasteland. Frozen, starving, with their animals dying around them, isolated in the northern waste behind an ever-growing wall of sea ice. Did the Vikings hang on to their old ways, trying to raise cattle and sheep as they had always done, courting disaster? Did these Greenland Vikings succumb to a crisis so overwhelming that those who could not escape simply took to their beds to wait for the inevitable? Professor Thomas McGovern has pursued the answers to these questions for three decades. He has excavated sites here in Iceland as well as in Greenland. He is the coordinator of an international multidisciplinary organization that has been actively investigating the Greenland Vikings' disappearance. Evidence from both Greenland and Iceland is critical for solving the mystery. In Greenland's eastern settlement, every fragment discarded while the farm was occupied was painstakingly gathered up. By the time the excavation closed, 
50,000 samples were ready to be sent around the world for analysis and identification. Some of the bones from previous expeditions made their way to City University in the busy heart of New York, where Professor McGovern studied them in detail. By looking at the bones and at the layers in which they were formed, McGovern can deduce what the people ate and how their diets changed over time. Got a tray of bones right here where you can see some of these animal bones laid out here. This is a pretty typical set of remains that you get from an archaeological excavation. Some of these things are cattle bones brought in from Europe. Here's a little piece of the sheep jaw, goats, pigs, dogs, horses. Uh, some of them, however, are animals that are wild or local. Uh, animals like caribou, animals like seals. But McGovern concludes the Greenland Vikings only turned to fishing and hunting when the mini ice age threatened their standard food supplies. And even then, they ate very little food from the sea compared to their Viking neighbors in Iceland. In Iceland, by late 1200s, early 1300s, the same period as we're just looking at this tray here from Greenland, if we look at a tray, a very comparable site from Iceland, a very small one, you can see there's, again, a bunch of bones here, but they're different. Fish bones. We have some, some birds present here. We have little fragments of whale bones. But most of this tray is fish, including one great big ling got in there somehow. A lot of cod. In Iceland, the Vikings turned to the ocean to provide what they needed to survive the global cooling. But in remote Greenland, their relatives seemed not to understand the need for change. Mariu Olsen is a native of Greenland and an Inuit historian. This land is big, it's, it's beautiful, but it's also very harsh. It's a harsh nature, so you have to have some certain skills to survive, especially in the old days. The Vikings didn't really catch the, the meaning of life here. The two peoples, the Thule Inuit, had been in Greenland for less time than the Vikings. Yet they used their survival skills and quickly adapted to their new land. Modern day descendants of the original Thule Inuit now live in remote coastal villages. Their ancestors arrived in Greenland from the northern Arctic in the 12th and 13th centuries. hunter-gatherers, and today in the remote areas of Greenland, the men still live by hunting. Boys make their first kill before reaching their teens. can be seal, walrus, polar bear, or whale. But these men from the isolated settlement of Capersillet are in pursuit of caribou. Over the centuries, the diet of the Inuit has hardly changed. It still depends on what the hunters bring home. During the mini ice age, the Inuit, like the Iceland Vikings, didn't go hungry. There was always game to be caught. But there was more to the story. Investigators had made an unusual discovery. Fully clothed Inuit bodies, desiccated over the centuries by the Arctic cold. Archaeologists have also found the mummified bodies of some Inuit people who are all dressed appropriately in furs and hides uh, and were clearly much better adapted to survive this mini ice age. This extraordinary discovery sheds new light on old mysteries. 
These mummified bodies of what appears to be a single Inuit family were preserved by permafrost and date from around the time of the Vikings' disappearance. It is thought they were on board an Inuit ship that suffered a tragic accident. The family drowned at sea. When their bodies reached shore, they were mummified by the cold, dry Arctic winds and preserved for history. Their extraordinary state of preservation has allowed archaeologists to study their clothes. Each wore an outfit meticulously tailored from skins. Caribou and seal hides thick enough to withstand the onslaught of the harshest weather. Even in death, it is evident that they were well protected from the elements. Their clothing is quite a contrast from that worn by the Vikings. We can see that as, as conditions grew colder in Greenland, the Vikings didn't actually adapt very well to uh, the changing conditions. At Heriosnes in, in the south of Greenland, archaeologists have found clothing from the 15th century. This is typical woolen clothing of the latest fashion. They wore capes, uh, hooded capes with long tails, which was the height of fashion at that time. But fashion is not always functional and in this case may even have contributed to the Vikings' demise. With the onset of severe cold, these clothes could not protect the settlers from the elements. Investigators concluded that as the mini ice age enveloped the northern latitudes, the Vikings of Greenland brought disaster on themselves by failing to adapt to the tried and true ways of their Inuit neighbors. The Norse and Greenland certainly perished in a time of climatic change, a time where the climate changes were mostly unfavorable to them. But it's good to recognize that not everybody in Greenland perished at the same time. The Inuit, who by this point were living in most parts of Greenland, survived quite nicely as far as we know through the same period, and they were the ancestors of the modern Greenlandic population which exists today. Apparently, there was some fundamental barrier that prevented the Vikings from adapting to the deteriorating but still survivable Arctic climate. So Greenland did not become uninhabitable for all humans. What it did become, though, was extremely hostile to the kind of society the Norse Greenlanders had constructed, a society that had all these trappings in medieval Europe, the society that had its bishops, its monasteries, its nunneries, its rich men, its poor men, all the bits and pieces of medieval Europe which had come into Greenland at this point were expensive. They were expensive socially and they were expensive environmentally as well. Isolated in Greenland, the Vikings seem to have held on to their old ways too long. Even though scientists found some evidence of wild animals in the archaeological record towards the end of the Vikings' presence in Greenland, they believed that the Vikings' belated effort to change their diet failed to meet their nutritional needs. Fossils of blowflies from Viking and Eskimo biddens provide evidence for etymologist Peter Skidmore to conclude that the Vikings went hungry while the Inuit had more food than they could eat. The species that indicate carrion on the midden are the blowflies. It appears from the, um, from the fly remains present that there was no carrion or even marrow on the Norse middens. We know that there was a lot of bone material, um, but there was no marrow. In contrast, the Eskimo middens, enormous amount of carrion and masses of marrow. They had plenty of it. They were availing themselves of the seals and the, and the fish in the fjords. The Norse economy seemed to have been based entirely on the sheep and cattle. So they were, there, they were taking all the marrow out of the bones and they were scraping clean and probably boiling all the meat off the bones as well. The conclusion that one would be forced to draw from that would, would be that the Eskimos could be profligate with uh, uh, meat products. Not so the Vikings. When they needed to most, the Norse failed to adapt and take advantage of the life-giving resources around them. Why, in the end, 
didn't the Vikings learn how to hunt from the Inuit? Thomas McGovern thinks the church may have played a critical role. The church may have played a role in this strange barrier between these two cultures. We might think that the Norse and the Inuit actually did not coexist in Greenland at all because there are so few finds of Inuit objects on Norse farms. There are so few examples of Norse imitation of Inuit adaptation. McGovern is convinced that the church preached avoidance of the Inuit because they were not Christians. If contact was forbidden, the Vikings would never have been able to learn from their hardy Inuit neighbors, even in this time of crisis. Why would a Norse seal hunter not pick up some of this Inuit technology? And I think part of the answer is, of course, if you went and talked to an old, experienced Inuit hunter and persuaded him to teach you a few secrets, he would have taught you about how to give water to the seal when it's brought up from the ice. He would have taught you about the proper prayers to say as you're doing it. Or from the church's standpoint, what he would have done was fill your head full of heathen magic. So we can easily see scenarios where the church's interest in, in limiting contact between these two cultures and regulating it strongly could have had a really chilling effect in terms of effective interaction, effective learning between these, these two different cultures. There certainly was a barrier maintained between them. It wasn't accidental. It had to have been maintained at some considerable trouble and expense on somebody's part for a long period. Evidence to support McGovern's argument comes from the number of churches built in Greenland. Testimony to the church's importance in the lives of the Viking settlers. These buildings form the center not just of the people's spiritual faith, but of their entire society. The church's power was clear. The adulterous seducer was burnt to death in the precincts of the church at Valsic. From a grave in the shadow of the Viking Cathedral at Gardner comes another striking indication of the church's power. The grave contained the bones of a bishop who was buried with his badges of office, his holy ring, and his crozier. There is some evidence that the church in Greenland uh, held a very firm grip on the people there. Uh, in the 14th century, as well as collecting tithes from the farms, uh, the church also imposed an export tax which may have uh, led to deterioration in income from trade. We also hear that many, many of the hunting rights in Greenland belonged to the church. So although there was abundant whale, reindeer, and polar bears, um, people could only hunt these creatures with the permission of the bishop. One of the things which is quite clear is the Norse Greenlanders had created vulnerabilities in their society to, to any kind of climatic or environmental change. When you have these cathedrals in the Arctic, when you have a society based on imported goods in a circumstance where connection with the homeland is, is difficult, uh, you're setting yourself up for long-term trouble. The conservatism of the society, its, it's rigidity in many respects that we can see in, in many different aspects, uh, seem to have led them, instead of innovating, instead of responding to climate change by going fishing or doing something different, instead they go down the same path and perhaps try harder. They build bigger churches rather than trying a different adaptation. From the stones, ice, and meadows of Greenland, the tragic story of the lost Vikings has finally come to light. Scientists have pieced together an amazing tale of failure. It seems the trigger for the Vikings' downfall was a deterioration of the climate. Ice core samples show that the mini ice age enveloped them, ultimately causing their crops to fail and their cattle to starve. In the cold, the people's health began to falter. Malnourished and weakened by ear and upper respiratory infections, young women and children began to die. The bleak history investigators have constructed tells that in desperation, Viking elders finally did try to follow the hunting and fishing techniques of the Inuit. But through ignorance, for the dictates of an all-powerful church, they learn too little, too late. The archaeological find of the slaughtered hunting dog revealed their state of desperation. 
Combined efforts by scientists on both sides of the Atlantic have pieced together a tale of doom. It seems to me very clear that they were living at the limit of possible sustained existence. Had they gone over to the Inuit lifestyle of adapting more to their environment, they probably may have survived. But I think that they just came to a situation where it was just not possible to continue their lifestyle. But there are still some loose ends, some crucial questions that the scientists cannot fully explain. Although they found many skeletons in the graveyards, there were none in the Viking houses. One thing that's missing from this, this whole grim story of the, the end of Norse Greenland is where's the human bones? And that's the real question. We have virtually no human bones from inside Norse houses that are contemporary with the end of the settlement. Um, they're just not there. Uh, we have plenty of people buried in the churchyard, but that's the sort of thing that happens in an orderly fashion as the society is still functioning. What happened to the last ones? And the clear answer to this question is we don't know. There's been speculation that the Greenlanders, or at least some of them, returned to Iceland. Um, it's a nice thought, uh, but we have no real proof of this. Uh, there's been speculation that the last Greenlanders were carried off as slaves by, by Barbary pirates or by other people and, and wound up as Icelanders were to do in later centuries, taken off to Morocco or, or elsewhere. Um, we again have no evidence for this. So we really don't know what happened to this last group of people. I think the most likely explanation is that the colony dwindled until there were very small numbers and then probably they sailed away and either never arrived or went somewhere and we don't know about where they might have gone. Scientists suspect that in the face of fierce adversity, the last of the Viking colonists in Greenland opted to take refuge on warmer, more comfortable and friendlier shores. have tried to return to Norway, their ancestors' original homeland. They may even have struck out for America. But whatever their intended destination, they first had treacherous seas to cross. My own speculation to throw into the pot is that, well, if, if you were failing your, in your farm and your whole settlement was going down, uh, a last resort might be to get into your boat and try to, to go to the eastern settlement, go somewhere else. And Greenland, as everyone who sailed there can attest, is a dangerous place. And just because you set out on a journey doesn't mean you make it. So one location for the last of the Norse Greenlanders may be simply at the bottom of the sea. Whether the last of the Greenland Vikings drowned at sea, ventured all the way to the American continent, or successfully returned home to Norway, it is clear that their legacy here is one of failed adaptation. These Vikings depended on a social system that lacked flexibility, one that worked in a certain place at a certain time, but could not change. Instead of adapting and surviving in the face of a deteriorating climate and an environment that no longer supported the population, it appears the Greenland Vikings succumbed to their own rigidity and disappeared from history. and new forensic evidence. Find more answers to history's greatest mysteries at pbs.org. Secrets of the Dead was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Secrets of the Dead is available as a four-volume home video set for $59.98.
Individual episodes are available for $19.98. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. Tonight on Houston Public Television, On the Waterways travels the Florida Peninsula from the Panhandle to the Everglades, followed by Nature and the Living Edens. Then Masterpiece Theater presents the conclusion of Monsignor Renard, followed by an EastEnders double feature. There is a place where nature is a sanctuary for life. Experience Thailand, Jewel of the Orient, on the Living Edens on PBS. Take a trip to Thailand, tonight at 8. The sun has long been a source of warmth and light. But we're just discovering a frightening side to our star. A raging force which peaks every 11 years. And sometimes, Earth gets in the way of a solar blast. Join us as we uncover the true nature of our unpredictable star. See the Solar Blast, Tuesday night at 7. Houston Public Television. Where you can see exotic birds, jailbirds, and love birds. Where there's adventure on the high seas and detective mysteries. Where you can get a big kick out of nature or a huge lift from the dance. Keep quality programming on Channel 8. Join the Producer Society. Your annual gift of $500 is vital to programs that entertain, inform, and educate. Anywhere is Houston Public Television. Next time on Hidden World, nature hides her favorite land in places far away from man. In India, where otters play and monkeys swing the day away and share the trees with flying fox and keep an eye out for the clocks. India's Otter Paradise, next time on Hidden World. Find the Hidden Worlds, Wednesday night at 7. It's got to be dead nuts on. It's got to be perfect. And to have it perfect, you have to use math and angles. This angle here is 10 degrees. This angle here is 16 degrees. This angle here is 5 degrees. There's a special wraparound angle here that we designed to fit the outside part of your foot. Most people don't even see that when they think of a skateboard. And all of that is done because we use now. I'm not just a, a wood carver cutting up a, a hunk of wood. I design skateboards. From the campus of the University of Houston, this is Channel 8, KUHT Houston, a service of the University of Houston and supported through the Association for Community Television.